Does it work? Yes. All right. Um, so today I would like to present some research um, that we do at our lab, but at the same time do it as a kind of, of a collective endeavor, a collective representation of what, um, what, the, what the research that we conduct is about. Um, I will be covering some topics that I think are very uh, familiar to the American audience in relationship to white supremacy and green uh, privilege, but I will also be uh, broadening a, a bit the discussion to the, to the European context. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background about who we are, like what is this lab that's called Barcelona, but at the same time doesn't really do research on Barcelona only. So we are a research collaborative made of um, so some professors like me, but then also postdocs and um, doctoral students who work at the intersection of public health, urban planning, political um, economy, and um, urban development in, um, in, in general. And in addition to the traditional uh, research output and research outlets that, that we use to share uh, our research, we very much also try to use media and mapping as a way to represent the, the urban injustice struggles that uh, we research. So for example, um, if you have a quick look at the website, just to, to, to advertise a few things that collectively we've accomplished, we have a series of um, 10 short videos about the drivers of urban injustice. What causes environmental injustice? What causes urban injustice uh, more, more generally speaking? And what types of um, manifestations can we, um, can we share based on European and North um, American cases? Then we also have this short uh, documentary showcasing four different urban environmental justice struggles in Barcelona to green or, or not to green. If you also wanna see how environmental injustices manifest in a very dense, uh, supposedly very progressive American, um, supposedly very progressive European city like, um, like Barcelona. Uh, we also are doing some mapping work with community groups on the ground that fight for urban justice from a variety of perspectives. Housing, sustainable mobility, food access, contamination, um, and more. And our idea here is to also integrate videos from those different groups, as well as their own um, platform of, of social media and media to, um, to share and collectively build this map of urban justice struggles. And then finally, a project that we have um, started before COVID and COVID just put a big break um, to is called the Green Divide, which is an interactive web documentary. I don't know if you're familiar with that type of platform, but it's a documentary that's not only linear, uh, but it's also broken down into different stories, different cities, and then it has some additional um, visual tools and uh, documentations and again maps and testimonies that you can scroll uh, through. Um, on the internet. So we currently, we're going to launch it partially uh, in the nature of Cities Forum at the end of February, uh, based on the stories of Barcelona and Nantes in France, but then we'll also add the other stories, the other videos that um, we are going to integrate from Boston, DC, Portland, Oregon, um, Montreal, and, um, and Dublin. <laughs> All right. Um, and then, Finally, we also have a blog if you want to have a look at it. Uh, it's not about the work that I do in particular. It's really a collective uh, composition of write-ups from people at different stages of their career and, and bringing together the research that does in, um, in a variety of contexts, also beyond Europe and um, North America. So anyway, what am I talking about today? Um, I'm going to develop the, air, the, the idea that underpins a lot of my research, which is the concept of green lulus, green locally unwanted uh, land uses, which is a bit of a pun on the traditional concept of locally unwanted land use lulu in the planning uh, literature, which tends to refer to undesirable land uses, uh, contaminated sites, factories, etc., that uh, racially mixed and working class neighborhoods have had to suffer for decades and at the same time against which they have organized. And here I'm talking more about green infrastructure, parks, garden, greenways, climate proofing infrastructure, the entire type of interventions or the series of interventions that, that green cities 
are putting in place to advance different environmental, social, and health goals. And the argument here is that the exclusion of the most socially and racially vulnerable residents, their livelihoods and practices from the green city planning call for new emancipatory greening practices. And I'll detail them a little bit through the talk. Um, so just to put some concepts on the table, what are we talking about here when we talk about green privilege, environmental and climate gentrification? We're talking about the fact that, let's say from a historical standpoint, the long legacy of segregation and redlining in the US has created neighborhoods with varying degrees of access to green space. So for instance, in LA, 56% of African Americans and 50% of Latinos reside in communities that have less amount of park space per capita compared to 27% of white residents, for example. And that has really deep ramifications from a health standpoint, knowing the contribution that green spaces have in lowering all cause mortality, but at the same time, specific types of health outcomes like obesity, um, chronic stress, uh, or other types of, of, of mental diseases. And so that's kind of the, um, let's say the static state of affairs if we think about the legacy again of urban planning and how it has constrained access or unequal access to, um, to environmental amenities. However, what we see also is that the rhetoric and the planning of the green city has for the past 15 years or so as a growing global orthodoxy created new types of environmental privileges through different dynamics of displacement. So that's an image of the city where I live, Barcelona, Passage San Joan, which used to be a very, very um, densely trafficked avenue. And that was remodeled six years ago, six, seven years ago into a green corridor. And that was then projected visually and also in different discourses as a place that pedestrians have gained a pleasant space and the environment has gained a sustainable design. But at the same time, it's been branded as the green street of Barcelona, where very much, um, where a lot of speculative investment has taken place. And at the same time, where undesirable residents like Asian minorities in Barcelona, especially the Chinese community, has been literally wiped out of the area and the business community has been very much undesirably la labeled as part of a non-desirable, um, let's say, type of activity and community in the area. And so what is in the end environmental gentrification? It's basically this process that I just um, tried to explain, which is the implementation of an environmental planning agenda that tends to be related to a variety of public green spaces that leads to the displacement of the most vulnerable population under a very noxious, if you will, environmental ethic that claims that green space is beneficial for everyone's health, for the economy and for the environment. But then if we zoom in on what exactly is environmental gentrification and how it manifests, what do we see and how do we measure it? And that's a lot of what um, the research is that we're doing at the lab, which is trying to understand the scope, the magnitude and develop different methods to, um, to pinpoint environmental gentrification. And then when I talk about green gentrification, I'm talking more about um, the green infrastructure aspect of the environmental planning agenda. So the argument here, and this is the main finding, if you will, which is not um, that difficult <laughs> to grasp or that revolutionary, is that displacement and dispossession are financial, physical, and social cultural. And so how do we look at them on the ground? One of the first studies that we did four years ago was a study of 98 cities in Europe, Canada, and the US, where we dissected thousands and thousands of policy documents, planning, um, planning mechanisms, trajectories, uh, branding tools, uh, just a big variety of, um, of, let's say, sources of data that helped for us to identify the green trajectories of those different cities. What are the different types of, of goals that cities had in mind? How present is greening in their, in, in their branding? What type of interventions are present on the ground, et cetera, et cetera. And as part of this research, what we looked at from a, let's say, 
statistical standpoint was the relationship between municipal green branding and social equity. So we ranked city through these documents according to their levels, what we call green boosterism, that is how present it is greening identity in the image and in the documents that the city crafts, let's say, for its future. And then how is that related to, um, to its affordability? And what we found is a positive correlation between high levels of urban green boosterism, meaning at the same time, high intensity rhetoric over a long period of time and high levels of unaffordability, even when controlling for population size and economic indicators. So in that sense, what we found is that green boosterism is very tightly intertwined with urban revalorization, with land value grabbing that leads to a less affordability, and at the same time, a very limited elite access to the benefits of greening, as you can see here in Vancouver, one of the most um, expensive cities in our sample, and at the same time, a city that has regularly been ranked number one or two in livability and greening around the world. Another study that we did, that was my colleague James Colony who led it, was a city in New York City, I'm sorry, a city in New York, a study in New York um, City, looking at the evolution of gentrification and greening from 1990 to 2014. And what he found was a significant positive correlation between the areas of New York, between the neighborhoods of New York that greened the most between 1990 and 2014, and those which gentrified the most. We then took the methodology a little bit deeper in the case of Barcelona, where we then pinpointed specific green spaces that have been built since 1990, and then looked very specifically at different demographic indicators around those green spaces to see which ones changed in the direction of gentrification more than um, areas that were further away from, the, from those green spaces. And so we used um, different um, geographically weighted regression techniques to identify the spaces that most contributed to gentrification. And interestingly, not actually not everywhere in Barcelona have we observed green gentrification, but what we have seen is the areas where there is a greater amount of greenways, the ones that are closer to the waterfront, and those that are in post-industrial landscapes with a housing stock that is very valued by investors have those that have experienced gentrification the most. And we've also noticed a displacement between the southern area of the city that you see closer to the water towards the area in the north of the city, where actually a higher concentration of minorities have come to live especially Latin American immigrants and Pakistani residents. And those might have benefited, as you can see on the map, from some green spaces. But if you then zoom into the quality of those green spaces, they are actually very close to highways and very contaminated areas. So again, greening for whom and what quality of greening for whom. We also took that study to Washington where we did at the beginning a very similar analysis. So again, looking at social demographic and real estate change in the vicinity of new parks built um, in DC since 1990. And there what we found interestingly is that actually the types of green spaces that were most associated with green gentrification are community gardens. So a form of appro appropriation of landscapes and spaces that have contributed very much for the past 50, 60 years to the well-being of African-American residents in DC now being commodified and appropriated both by developers and by the residents who come to inhabit the luxury housing that exists around them. And then we also looked at the directionality of gentrification. So basically we ran different types of regression to see what seems to come first or what seems to be most powerful. Is it more than greening seems to explain gentrification or gentrification seems to explain greening better. And what we actually notice is that gentrification is most accurately predictive of gentrification, not the other way around. So in that sense, what we see in DC and especially east, um, in the eastern part of the city is that gentrifiers come in and then push 
for greater greening and push also for um, for improvement in the green space that that surround them. So this capacity of advocating for um, for their green privilege, if you will. And as I was saying earlier, greening is also not about um, not only about physical displacement or financially driven displacement. It's also about the social cultural belonging that is or is not achieved in uh, green spaces. And so we did a, a, a study in, in Barcelona a year and a half ago, where we looked at different green spaces that have exist that have been built in neighborhoods that have gentrified at different stages. And let's say where gentrification is more or less intense. And the question we asked was, how does the redesign of green space affect young families and children use of these spaces? And then how do gentrification processes interact with perceived well-being of young families and children in public spaces? And what we see here is that the stages of gentrification matters. So in that sense, spaces that have a greater amount of tourism, commercial, and residential um, gentrification are also those where, um, where also though that residents feel the least welcome, they feel very deep sense of loss of community, and they also feel that they cannot trust their neighbors because basically the space has been taken over. and the residents actually pushed away from their neighborhood. And so again, this use of spaces really matters for also understanding environmental um, gentrification. We also took that to uh, the climate green infrastructure. So not only, let's say, any type of greening, but also where um, climate adaptation goals are, are, are are in play. Um, and so the theory that we've tried to develop here is the relationship between green resilient infrastructure and climate gentrification, where we observe that residents will be over time more exposed in terms of their home and their properties to climate risks due to privately led green resilience projects. They are also more social culturally excluded from the uses and benefits of green resilience. And then in the future, they will face different types of displacement because of real estate speculation and increased housing costs, but also the difficulty to adapt due to a loss of social networks. And so what is climate gentrification? What is green climate gentrification? It is a phenomenon by which working class and racialized minorities are among the social groups most likely to experience residential and social displacement in the short and midterm from green climate infrastructure and its associated gentrification risks. Some of this work, we've taken it to Philadelphia and that's the work of my um, colleague Galia Shokri and a few of us looking at green infrastructure planning in Philly against storm uh, water issues. What has Galia's research shown? It has shown that the areas of the city, so the census tracts that you can see here, the, the polygons that have gentrified the most between 2000 and 2010, which are the darker color polygons, are those that have subsequently received a greater um, percentage of acres of uh, green resilient infrastructure from 2011 to 2016. What have we seen also from the point of view of population loss? That the areas of Philadelphia that have um, gained the greatest amount of green resilient infrastructure, which are those in blue, have seen a greater influx of white residents. So that's on the left side, and um, they are the ones in green on the, on, on the right side. While at the same time, the loss of African-American residents has been seen in areas that have the least benefited from green resilient infrastructure, which are the dark, the reds and the dark red areas, and the same on the right map. You can see that the areas that have gained the most quantity of um, Hispanic populations are also those that have received very little green resilient infrastructure. So again, a reconfiguration of landscapes of security and security from, um, or in view of, of climate risks and impact because of the way in which climate adaptation planning is, uh, is implemented and is not accompanied uh, 
by other types of uh, social and housing policies in particular. And then I just finished with this slide um, looking at our studies, where actually the latest study that, that Gallia has done is related to neighborhood vulnerability to climate gentrification. So thinking about the state of affairs in five years down the line, and also five years down the line from the point of view of, of green planning. Where is green infrastructure meant to be according to the plans of the city? And how can we also estimate where gentrification will go? And so the study shows that recent, recently completed or planned green resilient infrastructure is and will be concentrated in areas that are the most sensitive tracks to gentrification, which are mostly uh, wealthier areas and gentrified areas already in the center of the city, and those that also benefit from uh, new tax incentives for, for development. I, I won't expand because I know these are pretty complex studies, but all of this to say that within the study of future vulnerability to gentrification, you can also incorporate the climate lens. So what are alternatives just to, um, to just try to, to propose ways in which we can move beyond those insecurities, inequalities, displacement, and really reconfigure the way in which we think about equity in the city. So that's also another part of the research that we do where we look at the policy and planning path of different cities and where we look at the ones that are the most progressive and where we find that the right path towards urban green justice seems to lie in finding the right mix of both anti-displacement and equitable green development policy. So a form of greening that is more um, inclusive, if you will. Next month, we are going to release this report. I'm just uh, presenting it very briefly, which is about policy and planning tools for urban green justice, looking at uh, 30 cities in North America and Europe, and trying to understand the planning conundrums that both contexts face from both a uh, long legacy of urban development and, and inequality, and then looking at the types of policy responses that are the most promising and that exists in, um, in each context. So if you look at, for instance, this anti-identification piece of the equation, on the equation, we've looked at land use tools, developer requirements, housing focused financial schemes aimed at homeowners, others aimed at ranchers community-focused financial schemes, and then other types of anti-gentrification regulation and ordinances, and we have 30 of them. And then we also have the other parts of the scheme, which are 20 improved type of uh, greening, meaning what can we do to really make greening more inclusive? Is it through having a minimum amount of green space in new developments? Is it about building interim green spaces? Is it about different types of administrative roles for green space management? So anyway, this is a big package that we have in our um, in a report, and I just invite you to have a look at it. It will be on the website. One of the cities that we talk about a lot and that is really meaningful in understanding social equity and greening is not in France, which used to be um, an industrial city, very much driven by the shipyard industry. And that has, since the 1990s, both associated greening with a, a social trajectory of equity and housing rights. And so what has non done is to basically decide we are not going to build flagship projects. We are going to increase the amount of greening everywhere in the city to make sure that all residents live within 300 meters of a green area. So in that sense, it took a very equality focused um, perspective rather than an equity driven approach, if you will, making sure then that you're not going to create development pressures. It also is going to have, um, or it, it, it also was planning greening around eco districts, but not the types of fancy um, funky eco districts that exist in Northern Europe, but really driven by affordable housing and where affordable housing was, um, was part of the, um, of the construction of these eco districts. And if you think about the difference, for instance, between the North American context, the US and inclusionary zoning regulations in Nantes, for any new unit or for any new hundred units of housing, 56% of those have to be either public or affordable housing. So the majority of the housing built in redevelopment areas in Nantes is out of the market, is decommodified. 
mostly. And that's, that's, that, that's really powerful for guaranteeing housing rights. That's a few images of Nantes. So this whole area that you see in the middle, which is the Ile de Nantes, has been completely transformed into a mixed use redevelopment with a lot of green space, very high quality green space planned and redesigned uh, with the residents for multiple uses and also the connectivity through the city. So there are no pockets of segregation. There are no pockets in Nantes of uh, spatial discrimination because the mobility by tram, and by bike, but also the pedestrian areas are all very easily to flow from one another. And there are no difficult transitions, if you will, between landscapes. So not is very much about having what they call the green stars and the blue stars, which are these deep and long corridors and greenways that will easily connect and make residents go from one neighborhood to the other. And because gentrification is very much controlled because of the housing laws, then you also do not have um, areas that are being redeveloped that are going to be highly um, speculative. These are some of the examples of the eco districts I was talking about, very much a mix of uh, working class and middle class residents and uh, an attention to design as well. And yet, if we think about contexts like the United States where the legacy of, of segregation and the and the, legos, and, and the legacy of unequal urban development really runs very deeply through many scores of the city. Is that enough? Is that type of model going to be guaranteeing the type of green just cities that, that we want? And so one of the last examples I wanted to explore here is um, the type of green, radical green alternatives that we see in some American cities, or at least proposals for them through anti-subordination and emancipatory greening in the case of Washington, D.C. And some of the principles that I would like to, to articulate here, in a way, are related to reparative and preventive justice. I think there's a lot of talk now in academia about the need for reparations, but also a need for prevention of harm. And so what, what I argue is that urban greening to be just and to be radically just should question experiences of domination, subordination, racial stratification and oppression, and the institutions around them, articulate and build emancipatory spaces and new geographical formations at the intersection of land, resources, and nature, and finally propose institutional arrangements, social cultural practices, and policies that are controlled by historically marginalized groups. So what does that look like in practice? Um, in DC, we have a project that's called the 11th Street Bridge Park, project, which is a $50 million project, and it keeps raising every day, so I don't know how much it is now, which places equity as a form of intentional planning process, meaning that this bridge, where you can see in the top uh, picture there, is centered around equity. E equity is, mean, is meant to, uh, to breathe through the entire project. And the idea behind this bridge is to construct a green space then that can connect the two sides of the Anacostia River, the east and the west, where the western part of the city nowadays has uh, the Navy Yard, which is a very gentrified, uh, very mixed use community. And they have the other side, which is, um, which is east of the river where Anacostia is located and a much more historically um, African-American settlement that is caught by urban renewal and, um, and segregation. The project proposes new access to green spaces as well as a multi-stakeholder um, fundraising initiative to develop an equitable development plan. So the idea is that we are not going to reproduce in DC what we have in the Chicago 606 or in the Atlanta Beltline or in New York uh, with the High Line. We are going to make sure that people are not displaced by this new greening. And so the community land trust is one tool. And then we have many other tools like a home bias club or the use of the DOPA and TOPA uh, laws in DC, which are laws that um, help residents gain access to, um, to affordable housing as, as homeowners. So we're gonna make sure that we have a plan in place for people to not be displaced. And we have that plan in place before the belt is bridged because be before the bridge is built because it's not built yet. However, 
what I have found through some research that I've done there uh, last, last year, that was one of the case studies as part of a broader 30 city study that we've done in the lab, was actually that there are limits to intentionality or limits of intentionality and then finished redistribution. Again, thinking about the legacy of urban renewal um, in the US. The CLT cannot fully address the intergenerational interracial wealth gap. I love the model, but in a country where the wealth of white families is projected to be 87 times the wealth of African-American families over the next five years, a CLT, because of the ways in which residents do not control land, both land and their homes, cannot fully address that gap. And that's what housing activists who are against that project uh, are actually uh, very much critiquing on the ground. This is a project also that's financed and advertised by global banks. It's been also designed by, by OMA, which is this international architecture fi um, firm based in New York. So it's very much part of the green branding of the city. And it's also part of the way in which greening can, um, can harness new sources of, of investment. Residents on the ground also say that it activates the commodification of greenness and diversity, as you can see on the top picture. There are several restaurants already that are very much hip restaurants that are trying to attract clients based on the fact that the neighborhood is going to be green and at the same time it's going to be dynamic and it's going to be um, this place that will that that you can have fun but fun also at the expenses of displacement what we also have noticed is that there is already speculative redevelopment project happening in the vicinity of the bridge there is a tiff tax incremental financing scheme right uh, in Anacostia. And there is already a project like the Reunion Square project that is very, very much uh, driven by, by, by market priced housing and very little by, by affordability. So in a way, what I'm claiming here is that this is a project that even though it's equity driven, it will facilitate a new displacement frontier as many local housing activists are, are saying. And as an alternative to this displacement, what are they articulating? They're articulating a right to place and a right to return. So you have organizations that, like 1DC that resists landlord and developers displacement tactics and convert tenant buildings into cooperatives. So a different housing um, model, but also a different workplace and work um, place development model. You can see on the top picture, the Black Workers and Wellness Center that at the same time articulates political power by discussing the intersection of place of um sorry by discussing the intersection of race and work and at the same time building uh new types of businesses that are led owned um, and advertised by by the local residents and finally there is also a lawsuit going on which is articulated by ari theresa who is trying to argue for the right to place and the right to return for African Americans that have been displaced by the demolition of Berry Farms, which was um, a public housing development built in, uh, in Anacostia. What we also see is some residents articulating a different type of greening, a more reparative and abolitionist greening, where basically it's not about only the fun, it's about a form of storytelling that can be uh, advocating and that can be relating histories of trauma, loss and also invisible practice of planning and resistance by um, the historic African-American communities. It's also about using networks of care to create community initiating projects and enterprising. And it's also about the disciplining and decommodifying landscapes. Because again, as I was saying earlier, the problem of the community land trust is that it doesn't, um, the way that it is financed, keeps white financial institutions at the, um, at the center of capital accumulation. It's also reimagining the river differently, not, with a, not like a place of green design projected by a New York-based firm, but also a place that you can revive informal and hidden resident-driven practices, like those that we see on the right, which is actually a picture from the Anacostia Community Museum showing the deep history and the deep connection that residents have had to the river, but that have been rendered impossible by 
by decades of contamination, but also a sense of insecurity in green space that um, African Americans have had to live through. So can this project be also an abolition or, of carcerality, criminalization, and environmental racism, this intersection that David Pello claims in his, um, in his last article? And what I argue is that the way in which the 11th Street Grid Green Project is, is currently projected is not doing that. It's not going far enough towards um, radical green justice. So this is my last slide. Yes, urban greening and green spaces are vital to climate, ecological, and human health. I always feel I have to say that because people end up uh, thinking that all we want are gray and contaminated neighborhoods, and that, that is not what I'm saying, so just to make it clear. However, achieving equity requires questioning the whiteness and exclusion embedded in the green city orthodoxy and how green planning remains decoupled from decolonial and emancipatory practices for racialized minorities. Thank you. Well, Isabel, thank you very much for a, a, a tour through the, the, the excellent work that you are doing in, in Barcelona, well, from Barcelona, uh, but around the world. And thank you for the, the great work you're doing. We have a huge number of questions. I'm going to try and get through um, some of them. Uh, first, Lisa Simon asks you to tell us more about how community gardens are linked to social change. So social change. Um, so social change, I guess in the slides, was a marker of um, gentrification. I'm not the first at all to say this. I think there's a growing literature um, that shows how community gardens are now advertised and are used by developers, by designers of places that can be an asset for new residents to move in and a place that also um, they advertise as you can be healthy in, in that community garden, you can get to meet your neighbor, you can uh, grow X and Y. And so there's a huge rhetoric that, um, that developers and planners are articulating for new residents that are seeking to move into a new neighborhood. So I think there's a sense of value capture for those new residents when actually those gardens were historically built by um, as places of refuge and as places of, of also informality and security for, um, for racialized minorities. I mean, you see them all over Boston. I think there's this deep tension now is, am I building a new, if you are a minority, you are absolutely asking yourself, um, should I build a new green space or will it be, or should I build a new community garden or will it be gentrified? And I remember one of my last interviews I did, when was that? two and a half years ago in Boston, in Dorchester, there was a resident who was displaced three times because he was saying that every time he was living next to a community garden and then he saw a developer flipping a bunch of um, townhouses next to him. And then those gardens being seen as now new places of, um, of, of recreation for the residents. And so he got displaced both social, culturally and financially by by the increasing cost of housing. And then he was then saying, you know what, I'm just done working in community gardens and trying to, to build them because I know I'm just gonna be displaced and his neighbors were actually begging him to not build new gardens. Thanks for that. Uh, a quick clarification question from Jason Beery. Uh, the work of Kogan et al in DC found that gentrification was the predictor of green incorrect or was it the other way around? So it found a stronger relationship when in the model, gentrification was an independent variable and greening was an outcome variable. So it was gentrification that was better predicting greening, if you will, because we were able to test that relationship in ways we hadn't done in Barcelona. That was really interesting in that sense. It was gentrification comes first. Uh, question from Jordan J. Any examples you came across that have led to less or no green gentrification? How might green infrastructure planning and development improve? I think you've, you've talked about that, but uh, Jordan wants, uh, I think, maybe a little more. I mean, some of the best models that we have in Europe are in Vienna, for instance, which is a city that has a very deep, uh, actually socialist, self-claimed socialist history 
that um, started in the early 20th century with a very radical workers movement that was embraced by the municipality and where a lot of um, public housing was built, also co-op uh, housing, and where also rent is very regulated. So you have this huge legacy of uh, housing that really protects a city or protects residents from a city that is also very, um, very green. So I think that's one of our best examples. You have good examples also in Northern Europe, like Amsterdam and Copenhagen. Again, not they don't have the types of radical policies that Vienna has, but they have very good access and good access to decent quality uh, public housing. And they also have a big co-op market. It's all being commodified now. It's all being part of the neoliberal city. But let's say it's a long way from New York, you know, or, or even maybe Boston. Yeah, and it's worth saying that when the world livability tables come out, Vienna is always up there towards the top. So, uh, you know, a socialist legacy um, maybe is compatible with, uh, you know, some of the, uh, the livability concepts that, uh, that are measurables in these, these projects. Uh, question from Lisa Simon. Can you speak to the power or not of land trusts for housing? I mean, I think you have a very, you have an excellent model um, in Boston with the Dudley Community Land Trust, and uh, it's and it's really deep history of, of of organizing beyond um, access to housing for for quality green spaces. So I think that I'm not maybe given enough credit to the land trust, especially I think in places where you don't have that type of um, very emblematic flagship greening as you have in DC. I think for me, what's very problematic in DC is that you have a project that is supposedly driven by the community, but actually is projected by a New York firm, financed by global um, companies. It's advertised by the mayor. Um, and, and at the same time, you have the community land trust, which is trying to just palliate what might happen when residents are like, wait a minute, this is a project that's gonna cost 50, 60 million euros. There is a dollar, sorry, there's a bridge already. Let's just renovate, let's just uh, restore the banks of the Anacostia River, again, driven by this history that I was talking about, this deep history of, of place attachment, alternative green uses by the residents, let's dedicate you know, all of this money to, um, to incubators for black owned businesses to, to, to training. Why do we need 50 million bucks just to build a bridge? Okay. Just for clarification, many of you are asking about references, citations. Um, this presentation will be up on the Tufts website. Uh, it will be up, um, shareable are gonna do some work um, on the audio and we will fully reference uh, the works um, that have been cited by all, uh, by, by Isabel and by our future uh, presenters. Um, let's see, many, many, many more questions. Um, again, from Lisa Simon, that this point about community gardens, and I, I want to you know, piggyback on this, some of the research I've done, um, we found that community gardens, certainly in New York City, and certainly the Puerto Rican and Dominican gardens are more about a social space than a cultivation space. And mm -hmm. for this reason, you know, they are absolutely central to um, communities. And, and, you know, to the extent that the, the research found that there are gardeners, there are friends of the garden, and mm -hmm. then the majority of people are just friends of the space. Um, because when we talk about community gardens, you know, I, I see people nodding and, you know, they, they're urban agriculture types and they're thinking about productivity. But has this come up much in your work, Isabel, the, the absolute necessity of these spaces as safe or brave spaces for immigrants? Oh, God, so, so much. I mean, that was one of the center topics of my dissertation when I looked at um, community gardens. I mean, that was not only what I... I looked at that my three cases from, from Boston, Havana and, and, and Barcelona were so much about these spaces of refuge, these safe havens that you're talking about, like a space that I can be with my networks, with my, um, with kind of multi-generational support, this place also even of, of political power, power building mm -hmm. um, that just fulfills so many more important social and political roles than maybe in many cases, as you were saying, uh, food, food security. 
Thank you. Um, Neil Grenflo, uh, Executive Director of Shareable, has asked the following question. What do you think of the recent moves by certain US cities and states to abolish single family residential zoning? Will it lead to equity gains and increased access to green space and other valued amenities? I think it's interesting because I have found both arguments and that's actually one of the, um, one of our findings in the report that I was talking about that in uh, cities like Dallas or Houston, uh, historically black neighborhoods, residents are asking for uh, the preservation of, uh, of, of single families because those are um, part of, of initial historic settlements uh, 200 years ago of those black families. So in that sense, they are asking to preserve um, those single lots. And then you have other cities where as you are saying, if I understood your, your question right, that is completely reversed, that, that people do not want to keep them to avoid the, the privilege that can be harnessed in, in one single lot. So I don't know. I think I have seen both. I'm not an expert on this question, so don't quote me, but I think <laughs> research has been both. <laughs> Well, I'm going to take chair's privilege and ask you a question, Isabel. Um, I mean, you did some great work in East Boston, um, around the airport and around the gentrifying um, sort of East Boston neighborhood, traditionally Latinx. Um, and, and my take on it was that you were finding that these new developments were, um, had built in adaptation features that could even worsen mm -hmm. the potential flooding or other effects for mm -hmm. the other neighborhood mm -hmm. or for those in the neighborhood around so we're almost getting a yeah this i mean this is you know this is green gentrification on steroids this is um it's almost like building a castle around yeah the, the moat around it so any any more thoughts on that isabel what what's what's your latest thinking about this this protective um gentrification i mean i think you know, revisiting some of the some of the interviews with uh, with local planners from the from the plan from the planning agency, you could really see how somehow they just didn't see it coming, uh, or at least they claimed they didn't see it coming because, in their views, um, that was land that um, they gave a construction permit to um, in the mid or late two thousand during the economic crisis. And then um, the single permitting process without um, just a landscape analysis or a sea uh, level rise risk analysis just completely omitted the fact that now you have these Legos of high end enclaves that are plastering the waterfront that are creating issues with landscaping elevation and then flooding that are not properly solved. And then um, the Boston, you know, Boston planners saying, oops, you know, we should never had, have done this type of single uh, permitting. We should have done a much, much, much better site planning. And so for me, it just baffled me that that wasn't taken into consideration. So that was one part of it. Um, and, an and just another part of it is the, you know, interviews with developers that in many ways they believe, I mean, you, you could see some of them, not that everyone is a, is a bastard developer, but, and, and it's just, there to um to capture value but many of them believe that the amenities that they built the resilient shorelines and the park and the very nice landscaping around their buildings is a really nice um open space for uh, residents as part of the chapter the, the massachusetts chapter 91 open law so they said you know we abided by the terms of the law we built all of this this is great it's going to go to the residents but th there's this sense of knifeness that doesn't realize that people do not necessarily feel connected to those spaces because they are surrounded by these super high-end restaurants and, um, and, and building. And so there's this social displacement that's very deep. And at the same time that in the end, they are very exclusive green infrastructure. And so this privatization of urban greening is also a problem because rather than maybe doing these open space um, public amenity development that chapter 91 is meant to um to provide i think it creates these exclusive um very exclusive greening yeah thank you uh georgia ss um aka local ecologist on twitter has asked you highlighted the inequity of greening in the footprint of highways and other forms of pollution can you talk a little more about this 
Yes. Um, not maybe for the case of Barcelona, but in places like um, Seattle, for instance, in South Park or um, San Francisco's, um, um, what is the name? Oh, I forgot about it. No, sorry, I'm, uh, it's, it's late here. Anyway, in several landscape, in several uh, sites that um, have both received greening and overall um, restoration of the landscape, we also see a juxtaposition or um, let's say overlapping risk with historic contamination that doesn't get um, get taken away. And so you have these multiple risks where you, are, you have maybe a bit of greening, but the rest of the landscape remains gray. And so from a health standpoint, you're still very much at risk. So we're writing about this now, this kind of compounding uh, and overlapping health risks, both from greening that might displace you, but at the same, and, and you're not using it, and at the same time, the legacy of environmental contamination that you still have. Actually, Boston is not very far away um, from that either. I was referring, sorry, to Hunter's Point in, um, in San Francisco. So Governors in New York, Hunter's Point, South Park uh, in Seattle or West Dallas, you have these deep, deep, deep uh, compounded environmental risks that, that minorities have to live with. Um, Mimi Shala is asking, um, I wonder how recent movements for commoning could help us imagine decolonial and reparative forms of access to land, as well as social spaces, shared housing, libraries, tools, etc. What do you think of greening via commoning? The discussion that we had a bit earlier um, about community garden or informal uh, spaces in actually very invisible spaces that um, residents have, um, residents of color have used or um, built a space for themselves in the past, like highway underpasses or um, cul-de-sacs or areas that have historically been, been invisible to planners, but now they become part of the revitalization revitalization of a space. I think those are spaces for where, where commoning has happened very, very much in, in, in the past and I think should be protected. I think it goes back to what we were saying earlier, the importance of social spaces and also um, alternative spaces for housing. I think that's very much what uh, the degrowth movement in Europe also um, calls for. What that doesn't solve, and that what doesn't solve in my mind, and I don't have a response to that, is what I was saying earlier as a statistic. In five years, white families will own 87 times the wealth of black families. Commoning doesn't solve that. So if you do not have access to, um, to assets for your family, for your community, you still cannot send your kid to college, or you cannot still buy a home for your family. Um, one or two generations down the lines. And that's, that's for me, a deep concern, which is why even as a left-wing European, I cannot turn away fully from the market. We just got a clarification point here from uh, UEP alum, John Baldock, who's also a senior planner within the uh, city of Cambridge. There is a master plan for coastal resilience in East Boston that involves a barrier that protects uh, areas in the interior of the neighborhood. I think the challenge is how to coordinate the individual developments and harness them. John, uh, you're on the call. Uh, any, um, any more on that? That's, that's intriguing. John Baldock around? Yep, sorry, I was... No problem. <laughs> not, I'm muting. Um, yeah, I, it, I, Boston has, has a series of plans for coastal defenses that you know, involve mostly sort of combining park and public amenities, um, but they serve as storm surge barriers. So East Boston was the first one that they, they did. So, I mean, I think some of the speakers points about the planners realizations are, you know, correct that they didn't, um, it was hard to really think through all the complexity of how you, manage all these individual developments and coordinate them with that plan and the complicated permitting processes that happen. But there is that plan there. So if it comes to fruition, then, then I think it has a benefit for the whole neighborhood. So it's not just a matter of these individual developments having, you know, displacing flooding onto other properties that can't protect themselves. My fear is that 
the pace of displacement is way faster than the pace of planning action. And so now yeah. it's too yeah. late. But it's my fear, it's like South Boston. It's kind of too late unless you really revert, you really ch revert a lot of things that you've done. Yeah, no, I can't disagree agree with that. This, it's a huge challenge. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time. Um, there's always uh, more questions than we can get to. Isabel, I remember you as a PhD student. Now I see you as a, a brilliant researcher. Um, keep doing the great work you're doing. Thank you for being our first person. Next week, we have uh, Dr. Jane Engel from the uh, McConnell Foundation in Montreal, who's going to talk about sacred civics. What would it mean to build seven generation cities? I am so looking forward to that. Thanks, everybody, and hopefully see you next week. Thank you.